Welcome to Law and Justice. I'm Jane Mulcahy. This is a special series on the topic of how to talk policy and influence people. And this afternoon, I'm joined with Peter uh, Dorman from Community Action Network. Hi, Peter. How are you? Hi, how are you, Jane? Thanks for um, joining me today. And what I'd like to talk to you, I suppose, about, Peter, is community safety and issues around restorative practices because I know you're very interested in those but, but before we launch into that maybe you can tell me a bit about yourself um, you know how you got involved in community development and community activism and that type of thing please. Hmm. Yeah I, uh, well I suppose I trace it back to growing up um, here in, in Donamede where I'm, I, where I'm from um, and uh, as a as a young fellow, I got involved in the summer projects here. They were they were kind of new at the time in the city, and I volunteered. I was about fourteen, I'd say, and I just loved the uh, the whole thing about about community. This was a this estate here was um, was only open in a few years, um, so all the families came in from all over the city and and outside the city as well. Um, there was no church, no shops, no 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 nothing. There was hardly any public transport, and um, there were cattle walking up and down the road. Um, so uh, you know, I was I was grew up in a community that was developing. Um, well, I think I got kind of a taste for it there, you know. Um, and later on, I, I just became involved. I, I was very influenced by um, by a thing called Train for Transformation, which is a community development kind of education process uh, comes from comes from South Africa so from Africa from Kenya and South Africa um, which was uh, really about um, what community development is all, is all about for me which is the people who are most affected by injustice um, being finding their voice connecting with others getting organized and changing the systems that are uh, causing that injustice for, for themselves and for others like them and that's 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 what I um, that's what I I've come to do ever since. Okay, and so Community Action Network, what is that actually? Because uh, people in Dublin may or may not know about it, people in Cork may, but but perhaps they don't. So what what do you guys do there? Yeah, so uh, Community Action Network was founded around 1987, I think it was, um, been going around a long time. Uh, it began as a response to um, local activism uh, around the city in Dublin, around unemployment and housing and various issues, uh, drugs and so on as well. Um, and that those activists felt they were very unsupported, that they didn't have any training, they didn't know, you know, maybe how to go about doing certain things uh, or community organizing and all of that. And uh, Community Action Network came into being um, to, to support, to provide support uh, for. for those kind of folk um, and then it grew and developed over the years uh, into and does a whole load of different things but it still is very we are still very interested in developing local leadership uh, through learning programs um, we're still very interested in uh, activism and uh, taking on issues we we've, we've brought human rights very much into our work in, in the last decade um, so focused on issues like community safety, like housing and so on, to try and bring about change. Um, and we also have become very interested in dialogue uh, as a way of, um, of, of, of actually bringing about change at a relational level. Um, because ultimately the people who we kind of are struggling, we feel we're struggling with and against, um, it's only through uh, dialogue and relationships with those, those, those folk that, that things actually really change. So. Uh, we've become interested in that stuff too. Okay, Peter, thanks very much for that. That's very interesting and helpful. And so would you personally or either through work or through, um, you know, these various projects that you've been involved in over the years, have you engaged in the policy making process at all? And if so, can you maybe give a few examples? Yeah, um, it's kind of, we, we don't, we don't set out to sort of change of policy um you know we're 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 very much coming i suppose from from the grassroots um using a, a community development model in that sense so to give an example um we encountered many many people in particularly in local authority housing uh, particularly flats complexes who uh, live with um, mold all over their walls and uh, it makes them very sick 
um, and it's a very common problem. And uh, part of the reason why that was not getting addressed was a policy within the local authority, not just in Dublin, but all over the country, local authorities have this policy that any damage arising from compensation is the responsibility of the tenant. Um, so this, this was a, a really unjust policy because actually most of the mould is caused because of structural issues in the buildings or because the buildings aren't ventilated properly to clear um, mould. And so, but it, it led to um, councils responding to, um, to tenants who were complaining about this by saying, well, you're drawing your washing on the radiator and that's the reason for the, for the damp or you're not opening your windows or whatever, even to people who don't have any outdoor space to dry their washing, private space, or and people can't open in their windows in December and January and all that. Yeah. So, and even if they did those things, it didn't make any difference, but there was no response. So that became something that we, we did challenge uh, and, and point that out and say, here is something in the policy and it's not fair. Um, now the policy, that policy is actually, it's still written there, still in the tenants' handbooks, uh, and the public notices, if you go into a Dublin City Council office, it still says that on the public notices, even though the council has voted that, that that's not the case and it shouldn't be, shouldn't be, um, it shouldn't be something that tenants are told. Um, but the actual um, practice of blaming tenants has lessened. Um, so in some ways, what the policy, you can, you could argue that you can change the policy, um, rewrite it or whatever, but the practice doesn't change. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's it's more helpful to change the practice and the policy just withers away because it mm -hmm. didn't, doesn't mean anything anymore. Yeah. Uh, that would be an example. Okay, this. thanks, Peter. And so I'm aware that you've been involved in commissioning and coordinating a number of research projects such as building community resilience that Dr. Johnny Connolly from UL was involved with. Um, do these type of projects aim to influence criminal justice and in particular policing policy as well as on the ground practice? Uh, well, yes, I, it's interesting in, in terms of, of that particular piece that you mentioned, building community resilience, um, uh, which you played a hand in as well. Um, I, I, <laughs> I think uh, that it was interesting because of the Commission on the Future of Policing, which was pushing a particular new direction for policing, which was embracing community safety, uh, embracing um, working in partnership with grassroots and local people, uh, and other agencies. Um, so what we were actually doing there was trying to support a policy rather than actually bring a new one into being because that policy was there but it, but it, it was only new and it, it, it's still being developed. It hasn't even, it's, it's going to be uh, legislated for uh, at some point but um, it was really about trying to um, trying to support that policy by changing the practice again. Um, so building community resilience was pointing towards it was it was focused on Dublin South Central area and it was it was pointing towards uh, the sorts of responses that were needed to tackle uh, antisocial behaviour connected particularly with the drug trade in which a lot of young people were being drawn into um, and it was having a ter is having a terrible effect on the lives the quality of lives of people who have to live with the with the stuff going on outside their homes um, so the the, the way to, to kind of approach this is one that involves not just police but at all. Um, police have a role to play, but it's, it's much wider than that. It's, it's neighbors, it's uh, youth projects, it's uh, schools, it's all kinds of, of, of folk who are involved in, in, in a local community and have a part to play. Um, so, it, and, and developing ways of doing that, um, like community crime impact assessments, which which take the, the, the pulse of people's feeling and how people feel um, they are in their community that's under threat on this kind of stuff and using that as a baseline measure for change. So that, does the feeling change or um, does the feeling stay the same? Uh, that, that's the real measure for change rather than uh, the number of arrests or seizures of drugs or whatever. Um, so the, these kinds of initiatives uh, are trying to make the policy that's actually coming at a, at hopefully at a macro level, bed it down and ground it in, in, in reality. Uh, so again, it's about sort of trying to change the practice. 
in triumph transformation we always talked about uh, change being about um uh, uh, power about changes in power changes in in resources their resources are allocated but also changes in beliefs and values and and the culture of, of something um so we're trying to change the culture and the, then the written policy can come later um you know so i think that's the approach we've been taking yeah, it's very interesting. And to go back to something that you mentioned about relationships and, and kind of repair, um, I suppose in some of these communities as well, maybe that are most impacted by antisocial behaviour and crime and substandard housing and many other complex social factors, there might be tense relationships, not just between neighbours or older people and youths in hoodies, but also maybe between residents and, and the guards or residents and the local authorities, mutual suspicions or kind of um, feeling, you know, that both are being blamed and no one's listening to the other side or doesn't understand. Can you tell me a bit more about the community crime impact statements and what, what does it do and what does it aim to achieve, Peter? Yeah, well, as I said, we got this idea from um, uh, um, from a Guardian Inspector report that recommended that community impact statements would be would be used in Ireland. And they, what they are in Britain, for example, is a statement that can be read in court um, uh, on the impact of a particular criminality behavior or whatever on a, a community rather than a, like a victim impact statement is on an individual but this is on a community on an area um, and uh, so we, we, we thought it was a really um, good uh, thing to try and look at how we could adapt this because what it was doing was it was very much in, in tune with with a human rights approach because a human rights approach is sort of recognized that it's a rights violation violation um, but it has this thing called progressive realization. So it measures progress of any, so it doesn't just say point out that there's a violation here, but it also says there must be a plan to address that and to measure, there must be a way of monitoring the progress of that. Um, so taking that into this kind of situation, as I say, it's taken a measure, and it's taken a measure not of the amount of guard activity or whatever, but it's taken a measure of the impact on people. Um, in their, in terms of their sense of being afraid, of being angry, of being humiliated, all of that stuff, um, and and actually believing it, um, because we come up against this all the time in the community safety work, this question of soft intelligence, as it's sometimes called, that everybody knows and everybody will say privately this is going on, or well, no one will go on the record and no one will say it in court for you know because they're afraid to or for whatever reason, um, so this gives that sort of um, talk, um, some status and some recognition. Uh, so it's about believing people and, 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 and saying, well, what you're saying to me, I value and I, I take it on board and documenting that and making that the basis of a plan to try and address the issue and drawing in then the various partners that are needed to address it. So an issue that's that's kind of affecting people, for example, along the Lewis line, um, on the canal there in Dublin South, uh, inner city, um, you need maybe to involve the, the, the company that run the Lewis, as well as the people who are responsible for the canal, as well as the Gardaí, as well as the local community youth work organization or whatever, to make a plan to see how, how that can be addressed. But the ultimate test of whether it's successful or not is, do people feel safer? Do people actually say, it used to be really bad around here, but now it's it's be, it's improved, and that's what you you trust. You believe in people uh, with safeguards and all of that. You know, you you talk to enough people and you get different perspectives and so on. Um, so we've we've done that and piloted that as part of an action under the National Drug Strategy. The whole thing about community impact statements, where things are read in court, where we can't do, I believe, in Ireland at the moment because the legislation isn't there. But apparently, that's been worked on as well. Um, we're using the whole assessments, which is a version of it, um, as a kind of more grassroots community development sort of model um, for, for what we're, we're, we're doing. Yeah. Okay. And so you touched on some of it there in terms of people's felt sense of safety or their, or the lack thereof, you know, so where they're terrified, scared, stiff, or they close the curtains, they, they keep their head down, they don't talk, they're afraid to be outside or whatever. Um, what are 
some of the main policy issues that affect members of communities, you know, with social issues like um, public drug use and consumption and sale, uh, antisocial behaviour and that type of thing? Um, I think uh, some, of the, some of the policy issues around that um, are to, maybe to do with um, the, like the, the allocation of resources and how that's decided. Um, so, uh, for example, um, it had been the practice uh, and it came out in the Building Community Resilience Research that you look on Pulse and see, well, where, where are the hot areas that are coming up a lot on Pulse? Um, and that can sometimes overlook some of the areas where the impact on people is actually really, really bad, but they, ne they never pick up a phone and call the Gardaí, you know, or they won't report it for various reasons. Um, whereas in another area where there's, there's a nightclub and people are coming out on the street, you know, four nights a week and there's aggro at 11 and 12 and one o'clock in the morning, residents will maybe pick up the phone and complain. Um, so that's a sort of, a, that, that, that's something I think that's, that's, that's maybe a bit neglected. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, the, the whole, some policy issues are really difficult. Um, and it's interesting that kind of the small ones, the small gaps, um, so, for example, the use of quad bikes, which has become a, a real menace around some areas, especially on the suburbs, um, uh, and the issue of whether uh, get, you know whether you have the right to, to seize them, um, especially if they're in parks rather than out on the public road, um, those kinds of things. Sometimes it's very frustrating because you, you kind of feel well, a, a little tweak in legislation there surely would make make a huge difference. Sometimes it's the smaller things um, that can that can make a big difference. Um, I think um, you know the the question of human rights and integrating human rights into policy uh, as well. I think that would go a, a long way. I mean that's maybe most obvious in terms of of housing. Um, and really, what we come up against again and again in in housing issues is. The whole question of you know the housing as a private right for people it's a commodity and all of that rather than something that people have a right to and it's not just a right to roof off bricks and mortar but a right to um a home you know a place where you can actually retreat to and, and feel safe and um, which ticks into the community safety stuff as well i think there's work to be done i know um uh, johnny Connolly and, and, the, and his colleagues have been working on this there's work to be done on looking at human rights in relation to community safety is not just procedural rights for somebody who's arrested, which are really important uh, to safeguard those, but also the rights of communities that are affected uh, the human, in terms of human rights and the human rights framework for that. Um, so, uh, yeah, so there, there's, there's a number of different, um, of different things that, that another one just in relation to the drugs stuff that was, um, I think we were working on, again, using the human rights approach where people who are um, uh, going in for, for methadone or whatever had to uh, give a urine uh, example in public with people looking at them and mirrors around them and all that kind of stuff, which was very degrading and so on. Uh, so one of the pieces was looking at, at, um, at changing that uh, and giving people's human rights. Uh, and it did change. And now it's about monitoring how much that change has been implemented and so on. So I, I think that when you talk to people who are affected, it's often a very, very simple thing or a very small thing that actually really matters. Yeah. Um, and you can work on those and maybe build up to the bigger things then. And of course, it's not always as well in terms of community safety. It's not just necessarily crimes that have an impact on someone's well-being and sense of safety. It can be stuff like dilapidated housing or failure to properly maintain estates or collect yeah. rubbish and stuff like that, that brings people down and makes them feel I guess, depressed in themselves and kind of mm -hmm. feeling like they live in a world that, or a land that the rest of the world forgot. Sure. Um, I think there's also, um, you know, real issues. I know there's progress been made on this, but there's real issues and not recognizing adequately uh, the impact on people who suffer from racist abuse. Okay. Um, so it gets kind of downgraded to aggravated assault or, or threatening behavior or whatever. 
and that just doesn't cut it because you know really and people who are you know who suffer this um i i don't so i don't really i can say i understand it but i don't really know what it's like but i i do have some empathy with how profound a market leaves because it's you're very um you're very self you know something that you can't change you know about yourself that you you have a certain color skin or you're you come from a certain place or whatever it is and if that's attacked you know um that, that and and that isn't recognized by the law i think that that's that's a real problem yeah, it's very interesting that you mentioned that, Peter, because there's a theory um, that's very influential in, in, in trauma theory um, about safety. And it's kind of that to feel safe and well, we must feel safe in our bodies around other people. And so if I'm a black person and, or a brown person and I'm constantly being verbally abused for that by other people or if I'm LGBT, and I'm, I'm constantly fearing that I'm going to be um, diminished because of an aspect of myself that, of course, makes you feel unsafe around other people. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. And in the community context as well, if I'm an elderly person living on my own and I see gangs of youths who are, you know, drinking and smoking, that will make me feel unsafe in my community because I don't feel safe around them. Yeah. Um, just on the housing issue and the right to a home, um, this whole COVID-19 pandemic has been interesting in mm. terms of the speed with which the state could act when it needed to, you know? Um, so the constitutional rights to private property were no longer an impediment yeah. to stopping evictions, um, to trying to provide homeless people with somewhere safe to stay, if only it was because of the common good rather than their own personal uh, human rights. Yeah. Um, do you think we, we might learn anything from this experience uh, in, in, in terms of what we mean by the common good um, and balancing the individual's rights against this collective? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's 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 very hard to know because it it's it's a unique kind of situation. Um, I think that uh, I, I, like there there was definitely a momentum. You can see it in the last election. There was a momentum of outrage building about the housing issue, um, particularly among younger people um, who who sort of you know are moving are looking to move into housing, and it, the health issue, particularly among older people who. You know who, who, who suffer more health issues than as, the, as we all do in, as we get older um so there's a kind of momentum building around that and then on top of that then you we have this this um extraordinary situation where as you say a lot of these issues were sort of addressed very quickly so hopefully those two things will will carry on into any anybody who kind of moves into government and legislation will have will feel well i have to take that on board now i have to say you know that this this has to be dealt with um so yeah i mean the the COVID thing is interesting because um you know at the same time like the narrative for a long time was about uh, you know stay at home and 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 go as a safe place and of course home isn't a safe place for a lot of people mm. um and um like I've just been in, in contact with people in communities and one one guy uh, living in a flats complex um, put it really well. I think he just said, look, the COVID thing just magnifies everything, you know, mm -hmm. and I think that really put it well. Yeah. When you live in accommodation, which is bad for your health, which is overcrowded, um, where, um, you know, you know, situations where, uh siblings male and female have to share a room one of one of the siblings being autistic mm. um you know th those kinds of situations that are are intolerable they're, they're maybe slowly coming to light um and it will also be interesting um the experiences of young people and and parents often like my experience as well like single parents who are trying to cope um with their teenage children who just just want to be out mm -hmm. um, and are, they're, they're, and they see others being out. Um, I was talking to one woman recently who was very concerned about her own health, underlying health issues. 
and her son is just out and she can't keep him in. You know, it just becomes a, a big row every time she raises it or whatever. Um, and those young people then are being sort of sent home by the Gardaí. Mm. Um, and it, so it raises questions. It's, I think it's raising questions for our youth services about um, about reaching young people, especially particular groups of young people, out on the street rather than in the centres. I know a lot of that's, that contact work was lost in austerity, um, but needing to kind of have devise particular strategies for reaching young people who are who are who are not going to come into centres, or if they do, they'll come in for a while and then they'll go out and, and be kind of lost or, or drawn into all kinds of stuff. Um, so we hopefully it'll make us think about them as well. Yeah, it's 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 a very um, pertinent point, all right. That if you know no young person likes to be on lockdown, well, no older person does either, or a child. But when you're you're developmentally meant to be separating for from your family as well and wanting to be in the world, it's challenging. And then, as you say, if you see others doing it, then it's like, well, why can't I? So the stresses um, for everyone right now are are fairly combustible I think and mm. where there's underlying tensions anyway and you know perhaps mental health or drug issues or um, intergenerational trauma then it's it's just a fairly um, toxic mix. Um, on the home issue as well though in terms of community safety from some of my own reading recently um, you know, your quality of life can really depend on who you live near, your actual immediate neighbours. And if we do have a right to a home, then you can't just render people homeless, even if they're kind of out of control and chaotic. So that's very difficult for the local authorities to manage it, isn't it? Even if they get lots of um, complaints about someone, let's say people aren't in fear of reprisals or you know having a window smashed even if they do get complaints um it can take a very long time maybe to move someone and then you're only moving the problem anyway to some other neighborhood have have you any solutions <laughs> to that massively complex question I, I wish i had i really do i mean it is like there are i mean you know there are some some situations it, it's complex in the sense that you know the, there was quite a while where local authorities were unable or you know the, the legislation was suspended because of the Dunnigan case or whatever um, and the housing act had to be redrafted and all that and then it came in with with more safeguards and stuff and local authorities are afraid I think they're getting more courage now um, and sometimes people are persistently doing stuff um, and, and you know they're there, there does need to be um, an eviction taken, um, and and that that hasn't happened for for a long time to any large degree, except for things like rent arrears or whatever. But um, but yeah, I, I really struggle with that one. I, I talk to um, talk to people around living around um, a family which is very chaotic. Um, people coming in to buy drugs, you know, right through the night, stealing, washing off the lines, um, uh, urinating outside people's doors, parties gone on, you know, right through the night, um, raids on the place, children seeing the door being kicked in by the guardy early in the morning on their way to school, all that kind of stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, um, or one woman told me, a council official told her that it would take it better for her to, to move it'll take could take four years to actually move forward but it'll actually take us longer to get them out right. um, whether that's true or not I don't know mm -hmm. but, but that that sense of being trapped in you know trapped in that behavior <clears throat> that can't be acceptable you know that just can't be right and then the raises the question well, what, what do you do with those people where do they go um you know and I, I do not know the answer to that i know that there's the stuff about housing force and the supports and there's various um issues around that too that people can refuse them and often do and uh but, so i don't know i'm afraid i'm drawing a blank on that one so yeah, no it's fair enough i don't know yeah, either yeah. i just thought i'd ask because <laughs> it's it's it is a big issue for some people um 
one of the other things that I've personally become so interested in over the, the course of my PhD was on the impact of childhood trauma on people. So not just in deprived communities across all, you know, ethnicities, religions, education levels, it doesn't discriminate except that there's more of it in deprived yeah. communities with yeah. unemployment and poor housing. Um, do you think that we place enough emphasis in the community context now on prevention and early intervention um, as part of community safety measures, Peter, you know, by supporting the families that need it the most? Well, uh, the obvious answer to that is no, you know, I, we, we certainly don't. And I mean, you know, I, I'm no expert, you know, uh, in all of these things, but but it does seem to be beyond doubt that early intervention is really the key to this. Mm. Um, and not only that, but targeted early intervention that very often it's 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 not that it, people's lives are, um, are set in, you know, stone and we, we can predict absolutely what's going to happen to people, but there are certain risk factors around people, uh, young children and babies coming into the world that, that we know this is going to be difficult. Um, so I, I think that my sense of it is that two things tend to happen. One thing is eternal pilot schemes. There are mm -hmm. constant pilot schemes about things, you know, um, and, and, you know, it, it, money is put into something to pilot it and see how it goes. And then it comes to the end of the pilot and it seems to have gone very well, and, but that's the end of it. You know? yeah. um, so that's, that's, uh, that's very frustrating. And the other thing is where on the other extreme where, there is an unsustainable amount of resources put into something that that is just like you know millions and millions and millions and for for a certain period of time and it's like well how can we ever keep that up you know um so i think that intelligent problem solving um targeted focused problem solving on early intervention um issues uh, and resources and all of that is is a really key piece i think it's as important as as primary school you know um we would never tolerate a situation where well we can only have you know we'd have to close half the primary schools because we can't or you know yeah uh, we can't afford them anyway it's just as important and i think that that would make such a huge difference if it were if it were available you know yeah and and it does seem that there's been enough there's enough experience in the world to know what works mm. you know in ireland probably there's enough experience to know what works let alone looking that's globally. right in some ways we don't need any more research you know no, we just need to apply what we already know uh yeah. and, and put the money in but it's it's um it's such an interesting thing because um you know children are so vulnerable and malleable and um a lot of the evidence around a trauma how it disrupts normal brain structure and function and ability to relate well to other people you know to even to empathize to to just sit still and learn in a classroom mm -hmm. so if you're up against it by the age of three or four or five schooling becomes more challenging you get labeled as a disruptive influence and and, and the whole trajectory can become that bit more difficult but yeah. in in the community setting um, where you've worked or the projects that you've been involved with, do you guys kind of engage with TUSLA and, you know, early years services, or do you think that there's, could there be further collaborations in that regard, do you think? Yeah, we, we, we do provide, you know, we, we, we uh, uh, in the course of our work, we do, uh, uh, we are involved with projects that are funded by Tusla or, or um, and, and who are doing early years work and so on. Not so much myself, but colleagues of mine are. Um, but I think one thing it is important to note in, in the, talking about the trauma stuff, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure you, um, you're, you're well, well aware of this, is that the, the toxic stress is not something that you have to be stuck with. No. Um, once, once it happens to you, it doesn't mean you're condemned then to a life of of uh, disease or whatever um, and there, there are ways of recovering um, and so there's also that piece as well about there's the prevention piece but there's also the recovery piece and I think that's that's really important to underline too um, so uh, anything that allows people to from a very young age to, to become fluent in talking about feelings and to begin to name things and to begin to uh, empathize with others to learn how to empathize with others 
um, <clears throat> to, to look for help and uh, find su and su supports built around people and that being integrated into our schooling and into our youth clubs and all of that kind of stuff, I think is, is a really important piece as well. And we've a long way to go on that, I think. Yeah. Connecting the trauma stuff we know with, with t um, designing those kinds of interventions. You know what I mean? And, yeah, it's so true that um, people should never f write themselves off or be written off just because a lot of very difficult things happened to them, yeah. Um, yeah. because that narrative is extremely unhelpful for sure. But one of the things that is very um, positive and what is buffering, if any of us are going through um, a high level of stress, is relationships, positive reciprocal respectful relationships mm -hmm. and so even um, in terms of community safety where people feel isolated getting residents together and building friendships and kind of empowering people so that they don't feel um, so alone is always mm -hmm. a, a very strong thing I know as well that you're um, personally very invested in and interested in restorative practices which is kind of about relational repair as well, you know. Um, can you tell me a bit more about that, Peter? Yeah, sure. I, I think that um, I am, in the community safety stuff, I'm interested in, yeah, sometimes there, there's, there's an approach that's needed um, that is about quelling something, you know, and this is where we need the guards, we need the, the, uh, the threats from the council and all of that kind of stuff to come into play. Um, because uh, sometimes these situations, and well, quite often these situations that um, just imprison people and people are not able to connect with us, they just lock themselves in their home. And you, they just can't, nothing else can happen while this stuff is going on. Um, but just m more importantly, um, I just want to say two things about the restorative thing. One, one being that uh, in my experience in one particular community where it seemed like this stuff was just intractable. You know, this area was just swamped with people who were chaotic and dealing drugs and all of that. And everyone just locked themselves away. Um, the Gardaí approaches, the council approaches, just bounced off it. It just didn't stick at all. The one thing that did make a difference was, was having um, uh, youth workers who could relate to these uh, young people uh, because they came from similar backgrounds going out, meeting them where they were, connecting with them, building a relationship, um, building supports in, and then gradually drawing them away into more productive ways of life, uh, into education into, and so on. And then some of them even joining with those youth workers and working with others. Yeah. Um, so that sort of approach, it's a kind of a restoratively informed approach. Um, it actually worked where all the other stuff didn't work. Um, so, and I'm really interested in all of that stuff as really what we'd all love to be doing like that that you know arresting people and all that is just sure. that's sometimes you have to do that but that's not really, really what we want to be doing so the restorative stuff is um is 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 important and vital from that point of view and i was put onto it by a, a colleague Aidy mcclary who said look this has to be part of any community safety strategy um i didn't know anything about it yeah. um but i trusted her and and and, and and we, we followed along on, on trying to develop that. And the idea being that um, people, I, I think the problem with restorative practice, restorative justice is in the language of it. It's sort of just, it's, it, it's cumbersome and it doesn't, it doesn't explain, it, it, it tends to get wrapped up and this is something you do when people have a row, you know, it's, it's a conflict resolution thing. But actually it's, it's, it's much more human than that. It's in the sense that it's, it's about, people learning how to connect with feelings, express those feelings, learn empathy, learn uh, what fairness is and, and being able to articulate what's fair and what's not fair, um, being able to just check in and, and, and kind of relate to other people. Um, so building in those practices with um, children at a very young age, going into a primary school, the very, very young tots in a school, sitting in a circle, talking about how they feel today, um, beginning to use that language as they go up through the school, um, learning how to respectfully uh, deal with each other. Um, if there are conflicts, how to resolve them in a constructive way, you know, and so on. And then into secondary school as well, then into the youth clubs, if they're in youth clubs, in their community centres and so on. If they do happen to interact with the Gardaí, that, that kind of, so it's building in that kind of culture of 
respectful relationship. That's what I really like about it. And um, that's what we've been trying to to do to, to kind of challenge cultures of blame and condemnation and punishment as, as the only response to, to uh, poor behavior. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I think that's really, where this is really um, core and interesting is a lot of the communities in Dublin, certainly that I'm involved in, a lot of the people who cause the harm are people who are very integral to those communities. They came from, they grew up there. People will often say, I knew that young fellow when he was a yeah. baby. He was so lovely. I remember it was a, you know, and now he's a nightmare, you know. Yeah. <laughs> As a little bit of trouble, we just want to hang him. But, but, but that connection is still there. And it's about sort of trying to work on that and build on that. Uh, we have a long way to go now. It, you know, it, mm. it has a long, long way to go. But, but I think it's a, it's a really good vision to hold on to. And Peter, are you involved in training with that? Or are there groups in Dublin or around the country that do specific training for communities that want to learn how to do this? Yeah, um, well, I, I don't, I mean, I, I'm not a practitioner in, in restorative practice. Um, I, I, I see it and, you know, um, I try to practice the stuff in my own yeah. life or whatever, but I'm not, I'm, I, so I don't, I'm not a trainer. I am, I'm trying to coordinate in a, in a, a Dublin 8, Dublin 12 steering group, the development of the practice. But there are, yeah, there's there's an, an organization, a wonderful organization in Tala called um, CDI, Child Development Initiative, and they have a restorative practice arm to their work. Um, and a lot of the training we've availed of has been been done by them. And they have a whole network of facilitators who do training. It's, it's quite easy to find trainers. Yeah. Um, and uh, the, the programs are very good. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned CDI because I know they do a lot of early years work as well and they do, yeah. are also very interested in trauma and adversity. And to me, actually, the restorative practices, um, it fits very much in with trauma-informed practice mm. and also human rights because it is kind of um, trying to, I suppose, prioritize voice and choice and respect and um uh, and i think one of the things with some of the traditional approaches in criminal justice don't recognize that many perpetrators were victims once mm. Mm. Oh, absolutely. so yeah. that that there's no relational repair forthcoming for them if you get me yeah. so yeah. um so having more of a restorative approach definitely for some people at least is um mm. yeah looking yeah. into you know yeah I, de- I definitely think um we need we need to, we need more if we need to bed it down more <clears throat> and i think that um you know uh the whole thing about community safety and this move uh towards it being all our business just like you know, our health is not just our, the doctor's business. It's mm-hmm. all our, you know, we're all responsible for our health and it's about more than just a, a medical practitioner. And the same way community safety is not just for the, about the police. And I, I think it's not just the police who, who are trying to catch up with this kind of whole new way of thinking, but also others like youth organizations, mm-hmm. for example, who have a real role to play in community safety. And often they'll say, well, that's not my job. It's not my job to be sort of stopping antisocial behavior. That's for the police. Yeah. Um, but I think that, I think that's beginning to shift. And there's, there is a, there is an overlap there. It's not that a young person, a, a youth worker go to a young person primarily to stop them from robbing shops or sure. whatever. It's about, you know, the developmental needs of that young person. But it's recognizing that in them doing their job well, yeah. They do impact on. Um, they do assist the community in um, in in, commun- in terms of community safety. Um, I know I was out on a outreach work uh, walk there with um, with a project in Ballymun there quite a while. They were saying, you know, when they go to the when they're hanging around outside the shops, and people just relax because they know they're there. Mm-hmm. Um, in, in the same way they might if a guard was standing there, but that they're not there as a guard. They're there. Yeah connect with the young people but it has that that result yes uh, of, of helping people relax you know um so i think that that's valuable you yeah know? Um, and it's it's something that, that youth workers then have a role to play in all of this yeah. um, what's what's been a real thread throughout this um series for me really is the importance of relationships at every stage of a person's life you mm-hmm. know um obviously with our carer first but also 
the wider community, teachers, um, neighbors, friends, building positive networks so that um, all children have, you know, one good adult at least. Um, mm. And so as part of community safety to, to, to be thinking in those terms as well and having a restorative impetus where it's appropriate. Um, and even sometimes maybe after prison, it might be appropriate to try it as well, you know, especially if someone's coming back to a community, whether they might be amenable to change then or, or maybe a bit vulnerable. So, um, so, so if they're coming back anyway, why not try and make it a safe, healthy transition rather yeah. than, than a fractious one, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's 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 very true, and it, it's uh, there are examples where where that kind of that, that kind of thing happens. I, I think that it's very complex the whole community safety thing, and for example, the the reason why people don't call the guards, you know, um, like there's different reasons for that. One, obviously, that they're afraid to because they think there might be repercussions. Sometimes people just it's just for some, a minority of people, it's in their mindset. I just don't deal with the guards. I don't like them and all that. Um, but for for a lot of another kind of core reason or key reason is that people have a connection with the people that they be calling the guards on. You know, they, they went to school with them. They grew up with them. They might be part of their family. So it's, they're kind of mixed, you know, in, in their feelings of mm. of causing trouble for them, even though they're causing trouble for me. So. There's often a foundation, I think, that when a person, when you see a, a, a person turn a corner and um, and begin to sort of give something back or, or whatever. And, um, you know, even when, uh, I remember one of the youth workers saying before about uh, your woman there coming down the, the steps, she always kind of growls at me. I don't like her. She's a whatever. Yeah. And, well, maybe, you know, sort of if you, next time you see her with her shopping, if you offer to carry her shopping up for her. Um, so, and he did, and right. he said, he changed everything, you know, so. That's amazing, yeah. That, yeah. that kind of thing is, is um, it's very simple, but it, the, the foundation for the, a lot of those relationships is there often in community. Yeah. Not always, of course, but, but it is. But they've been ruptured, so that's mm -hmm. where these little restorative mechanisms you know, we all respond to a bit of kindness. You might be a bit suspicious of some people if, if it's yeah. a big change, but it's kind of hard um, to respond to friendliness and an effort with hostility, I think. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Especially on a one to one. You know, yeah. I mean, sometimes it's, it's difficult to engage in. <clears throat> like when you're doing the, the people, I don't do it, but others are engaged in this kind of work. Um, there's always the thing of you're inter you're you're engaging in people who are involved in an economic activity. You know they're selling drugs, so yeah. it, it's sort of it can be inconvenient to be rocking up and trying to be friendly. <laughs> sure. <laughs> but uh, but the, on an individual basis and sort of around the edges and the fringes of that, yeah. it does it seems to be really possible to that people really recognize somebody who genuinely cares and um, and also has a message that it doesn't have to be this way for you. You know. Yeah, well, I did. I used to be where you are, um, and now I'm different now, and and so on. And mm. I can show you some things you can do, and that kind of stuff. And, and people do. It seems that, that people do respond to that. Um, yeah. they, more, I know some of them on a personal level who exited um, crime and antisocial behaviour and addiction, and also mm. I don't know if you saw it, but the Unteachables on uh, Virgin, a great show about the Court Life Centre and. You know, yeah. some of the youngsters would have been um, on a slippery slope kind of thing, you know, mm -hmm. um, with complex factors going on in the background or care histories, problems yeah. with drugs. Some had been in detention before, but just how a loving, safe um, environment providing opportunities can make such a difference, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the mainstream school system isn't set up to offer that kind of um, mm. wraparound support, I guess, that some kids need, and then they just fall out. Um, yeah. But I highly recommend it anyway, if you've a couple of hours to tune into yeah. it. Um, 
Peter Dorman, thank you so much for talking to me and uh, you do amazing work, really. Um, it's thank you. so necessary and um, all the community workers I've met, the passion and the energy and commitment, you know, and just the can-do attitude is really inspiring and we need more of it in the world, you know. Um, so thanks for that. And um, it was great talking about community safety issues and, and how they, they might intersect with public policy for this series. So thanks for your time and stay safe and well in, the, in this pandemic. Thank you very much, Jay, you too. Yeah, thanks Emil. Thank you.